Hey everyone, you're listening to the Active Turnkey Podcast, a podcast designed for hands-off passive real estate rental investors. In the Active Turnkey Podcast, you'll hear Tom Olson and Jared Stoltmeister discuss all things turnkey rentals with other turnkey providers, service providers, and rental investors. Our goal is to help you reach your financial freedom and whatever comes after that. Let's go. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Active Turnkey Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Stoltmeister. And as is usual, we have the Tom Olson. And uh, we are back. We are back. And we've had a little bit of a break. Yeah. You know, and we are we are starting things out on a serious note. This it's morning. true. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have seen this, but... And I don't, I, I don't mind promoting other people, you know? Sure. So the, I mean, anytime you kind of promote somebody, good or bad, you're kind of promoting them, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. So in a way, we're kind of making fun, but in a way, we're <laughs> kind of just doing it. So if you guys, you guys can see, we have the coffee mugs in front of us. And That's if true. you go to TikTok and you, like, put in their dad jokes, mm-hmm. which is partly how we get some of our jokes, just so you guys know, <laughs> um, wow. then uh, you'll see these guys do the old sip. And yeah, that's what they do. So that, that's that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna see how good it how, how good yeah. it works today. All right. With so mics and so with our our intros with the with the jokes this morning. Okay. Yeah, Tom. For me, with dad, I I have teenage children, and I have a twenty year old now. Finally, so they think like my twenty year old will actually laugh, but my teenage girls, they they don't like my dad jokes. I don't it understand. Irri- why. It irritates. I, I don't. Them. I don't get it. But I tell them, I'm like your irritation was the point yes, was was my exactly. goal it's part of and the joke that you got was it funny and yes, so i think everybody out there if you're a dad <laughs> yeah and you're telling dad jokes to your kids mm-hmm. keep on doing it yeah. you just let them know their reaction is the humorous strong, part of mm-hmm. of the actual joke it's so. tough you got it you got to keep going man keep pushing you got it so <laughs> jared what do you got this morning all right so here's the first one we, i got here why did the bicycle fall over I don't know. <laughs> because it was too tired. Mm-hmm. It was too tired, <laughs> folks. All right. So I got I, I got one today. Okay. You ready, Jared? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Where did the king keep his armies? <laughs> we can't even keep a straight face, folks. That's funny. In this his is... sleeveies. In his sleeveys. Da-da. All right, folks, that's it for today. That's the jokes. That's all can, we got for today. Can I jokes. say something though? If the if Tom's joke did not land well, it's not his fault. It's right. This is true. Our <laughs> our CFO, yeah, our CFO. Some guys, of you guys that watch this might know Heather. Yes. Yeah, you might know Heather. This, that that might be a CFO joke, which makes more sense. Yeah, it, she thought it was uh, more funny. Yeah, but we said. Hey, let's, I think let's it's put it good. out there. I think it's creative. Yeah. However, if you're like that, that wasn't the best. So where did he put his armies? In his in his sleeves. Sleeves. Yeah. You got it, folks. It's a CFO dad joke. All right. So there you go. <laughs> we're going to get into things this morning. And this yeah. is going to be a absolute unique podcast. We have never done this before. Um, and we are going to I, I'm going to try to do this a little bit more um, because I have a local meetup group mm-hmm. and some of the content that we produce for our local meetup group. Some of the speakers that we've had have just been absolutely off the top, over the top. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just been wow. And it's been so valuable that I kind of feel like, I kind of feel like holding it all into just the meetup group is almost doing a disservice mm-hmm. <laughs> to our community. Um, and we are actually doing some things with our meetup group. I'm actually going to be starting to sell a virtual membership to that. So if somebody mm-hmm. wanted to be part of that virtually only, um, we are going to start a virtual membership to that. Um, and it's, it, and, but it's also going to include all of our previous videos and all, all of our library of all of our events that we've done mm-hmm. and uh, the 30 days to good success and any courses that, that I, that I may have, have that right well. here. If you want to show them the, actually, so I've got a, a book here. I've got a couple, three books that we've, that I've written, written, um, uh, active turnkey, the best way to buy rentals, which is what the podcast mm-hmm. is, is kind of based on investors versus contractors, contractors versus investors. Um, this is, this is a, a part of real estate that I kind of sit on both sides and mm-hmm. that's kind of how I wrote the book. And then this is not really real estate related at all, but kind of really more life, ri- uh, you know, written to help people in life. Um, and, and honestly, it's, it's kind of, it kind of rings true. 
uh, real estate is not all about real estate. Mm -hmm. It's mo mainly about yourself, your journey, you know, your goals, and how you can get other people involved and how to create win-win situations. It's all about people. Um, and that's that's kind of how I wrote this book. Um, I kind of wrote this book for people that I was mentoring. And a lot of people would come to me and they want me to like just wave a magic wand and mm -hmm. give, give a solution to their to their problem, to their to whatever they're going um, through in life right now. And I stopped doing that. I said, you know what? I'm not even going to waste my time or yours because there's so many things I need to know about you before I can actually give an answer. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like I felt like I feel like so many people want that magic pill and there really is no magic pill. Right. The magic pill is really taking the time yeah. and going through the 30 days and saying, hey, what is my purpose? What are my priorities? Like, what do I want? Um, and, and really kind of giving yourself like a, this. This will actually give you, you know, we, we, we come up with business plans. Mm -hmm. That's what you end up with. You end up with a, mm -hmm. a life plan <laughs> or yeah. a business plan for your life. It's um, not a one size fits all. And it is a hard book. I'm going to tell concept. you, yeah. it's a hard, there's a worksheet after every single day. Um, and it's takes some thinking and it takes some soul searching and takes some, um, <clears throat> some, some honesty with yourself. Um, but today, um, this podcast, we're not, me and Jared aren't going to talk much about on this podcast. I know you guys are really disappointed. Oh, yeah. Um, we're just <laughs> going to kind of do an intro and an outro. And this is kind of part of it today. But uh, my good friend, Kevin Hutnick, um, he's actually managing broker. I don't, even, I don't even know if he's a managing broker anymore, but he owns a one of the fastest growing brokerage firms in the country. And I remember him. He was he was, he worked for me in 2012 and he came to my office and he said, hey, Tom, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Like, just tell me how I can help you. Um, tell me how I can help you build your business. And um, in this podcast that we're going to show here, we're going to show about 30, 30 minutes of it or so. Um, it really tells you about his journey. It tells you how he went from one deal. He like he just thought, hey, if I could just do one deal extra a year, mm -hmm. um, it'd be a little bit extra money <laughs> and it'd be fine. Now he's doing multiple billions of dollars worth of real estate every single year and he's making multiple seven figures every year. Um, and he's got I, I, 800 agents or something like that in, in, the, in the different brokerages. My wife actually has a licensee. She, he's a, she's a licensee of listing leaders. She has listing leaders affiliated. Um, so I'm good friends with him. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, if you own a business, I promise you there are business nuggets in here that will help you build your business in any business, not just by building a brokerage, but if you're a doctor, if you are a dentist, if you are in tech, I don't care what business you're in. Um, the things that he talks about apply to every single business. Um, and, 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 and I, I'm excited to have him on. So I hope you guys enjoy this. Um, any, anything, I think you, you, you were, you were actually there at that, at for that part event. of it. I, I did come in for a part of it. Yep. yep. So, so, so just give me one thing, Jared, you might've thought, Hey, maybe I remember him, him talking about this and that kind of, kind of, kind of helped me. Well, for, for me, my, my experience though with Kevin has been interesting because he, he uh, I'll, maybe I'll share more of a, like a, just a sure. interaction with him, uh, when, um, he had already he, like, so I came in later, you had already been working with him for several years. I started in 14 working with Tom. Uh, so we're, this is 10 years now working with Tom. And, uh, so five years ago, maybe we got a deal. Uh, and by that time, Kevin was already kind of hitting it big. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we had a, we had a question about a property and, he, 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 he came, like he met us. He, he, he walked to the house with us. I mean, he, he was like, yeah, hey, let me see how I can do to help you. And, and I, I was, I'm, I'm always impressed by his, uh, he's a very genuine, humble guy. Mm -hmm. He just, he is not a hot shot at all. No, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I guess if you're, if you have a brokerage that's doing what he's doing, if he's that successful, but I, you, you would never think when he comes walking there now maybe if he's pulling up if he's driving up <laughs> uh, he does he have some car collections yeah. yeah uh but if you if you if you see him after he walks in the door uh he's he's uh he's just the coolest guy ever and i think that that's so refreshing especially in real estate there's a lot of guys who are hot shots and a lot of them can be jerks uh not in our circle so much but um but uh, to me i think that's the biggest part his the, and i think that's what connects him to so many people i think that's yeah. why so many people like yeah. working for him i definitely say that's that's great for 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 kevin mm -hmm. um so like i said we're just gonna kind of go to the side and we're gonna let you guys listen to this <laughs> we'll come back at the end and kind of wrap up the uh, podcast for y'all but i hope you guys enjoy this podcast special guest kevin hotnick all right so kevin i'm just gonna have you kind of just 
start by just giving a little bit of your your story, and uh, you can kind of go as far as you want with that. And then I and I do want to get back to the NAR. I want to get back to building business, and I want to get back to sure building rental properties. So uh, thanks for having me. I uh, nothing off limits. You can ask me any questions you'd like. Uh, I started in 2012 when the market was still a little slow. Uh, I started flipping. Um, I started selling houses. I started acquiring rentals. Um, I worked for a great brokerage for five years and very good friends with him. Um, and then after that, uh, he was in kind of retirement mode and I wasn't. And uh, he just said, hey, go out, do it, and I'll help if you need any help. So I started you know, ramping up the business and started to uh, multiply and we're kind of where we're at today. So we'll go back to that first. Go back. I, I, I want you to tell the story. I'm not sure if you've heard it or not. So I've heard it many times, but go back to the story of like you wanted to do one deal, right? Sure, sure. So uh, I got my license for $360. It was a 56 hour course. Um, originally, I was in baby clothes and I had a store called Once Upon a Child. We sell, uh, like we buy and sell baby clothes and we still own it. Um, and I thought, hey, if all these moms trust me to, buy their onesies and equipment, they'll probably trust me to buy or sell their house. So I got the I got the license. Um, pretty simple. My idea was, hey, my parents buy and sell their house every year or two. And I watched them write a check for 30 grand to a realtor and I'll just do that. So uh, that was the goal was to sell one house a year. Um, I went, took the class with Macaulay um, in person, um, I passed the state exam that I didn't have no idea what to do. I was like fist pumping in my car. I had no idea who was going to hire me, where I go, what brokerage to go to. Um, I interviewed with Macaulay, Century 21, Berkshire, and then a, a guy that I ended up joining. And uh, he set me down, put out a few goals, and said, uh, Hey, I want you to uh, do this. Well, I was still doing about six days a week at the store. And I said, well, that'd be awesome if I could do that. But I work six days a week. I work 10 to 10. Um, but I'll, I'll hit the ground running and do whatever you tell me to do. So he drew up a list and said, hey, I've been doing this a long time and nobody does this entire list. But um, if you do this list, you're not going to have to sell baby clothes anymore. So I said, hey, man, I'm probably your guy. So I uh, just walked my butt off. The first six months, I didn't sell a single house. I ended up buying two fancy suits and my wife's like, look, you're the worst realtor ever. Don't spend any more money um, on real estate. So um, luckily the second six months of the first year, um, it started to kind of work a little bit. And I finished with 12 homes my first year, which was 2012. Um, it was great. My first check was 3,800 bucks. I've never gotten $3,800 at the same time in my life. Um, and then I just kept doing exactly what he told me to do. Um, I trusted him. Uh, year two, I sold 41 houses for him. Uh, year three, I sold 79 houses for him. Year four, I sold 119 houses for him. And then on the end of year four, I said, hey, look, like that was awesome, um, but I don't think I can do that again. It's a lot of work. I don't even know what day it is. And uh, he said, look, you need to go out and hire an assistant um, and and they can do all the paperwork for you. You can go out and do that. Well, I just treated this as a hobby the entire time. I thought, hey, the second I hire somebody, I'm, no one's going to call me to sell their house anymore, and I'm going to have to fire this poor girl. So he said, hey, hire a couple buyers agents. You just take listing side. They'll do the buyers, and you figure it out that way. So I went and hired a good friend of mine, Justin Bergeron, who actually owns a franchise listing leader now, and a, a guy named Jason Doorhorse, who was a client of mine. And I said, hey, like, let's just start a team. So uh, we started a team in 2015, and we finished with 242 deals that year. So um, we ran and ran and ran, and the actual broker came up to me at the end of the year. He's like, hey, do you have any idea what you made this year? Because I was still at the store all the time. And uh, he handed me a 1099 with $751,000. So I was doing it as a hobby, and that year I made $751,000. So um, then he said, hey, like, what do you want to do next year? 
He's like, I think you should start your own thing. And so we did. Um, I bought the cheapest building I could find in Valpo on Lincoln Way. It was $79,000. Um, I paid cash for it. And when I was at Barks, like, I kind of was protected because I just wore flip flops to closings and Hulkamania shirts and things like that. And nobody liked it. But once I went on my own, nobody liked me anymore and everybody was picking on me. So um, we, people either liked it or they hated it, but people started joining and that building filled. So then I went and bought a building in Couch, the old library, paid cash for that, that building filled. Then I went and bought a building in Lowell Cash, that filled, Homework filled, Hammond filled, Merida filled, Couch, uh, Knox filled, and it just kept going. And you fast forward from the day we started in 2016 to let's just say today, um, there's 30 offices, there's 10 franchises. We, fr we franchise 10 different companies, there's nine schools, there's 650 agents, and we finished with 3,200 transactions last year. So from 2012 to 2024, that's kind of, that's the story and that's where we sit. So cool, so we've kind of gotten a little bit into the business building um, of that. So I I'm gonna kind of stay there before we kind of switch over to NAR, but let I want you to go back. So you said you worked your butt off. Yeah. All right. So when you say you worked your butt off, what did you actually do? Like that, I, and I think this is where a lot of people get stuck, right? I think sure. people get stuck in that first little. So maybe you could even tell us what did Bart tell you to actually do, and what are those things that you did that you sure. feel like gave you the most. Pain? So what a lot of agents do now is they go to the office or they go home and they sit down and they log into Facebook and they put out a post and they think that hey, like that's going to help, which it will. But there's so many pieces of the pie when it comes to being a broker or a brokerage. And uh, that it's really easy to just get caught into things that waste time when you're working in your business, but you're not working on your business. If you don't work on your business, you're not gonna be a very good realtor. Um, you, you you have to always be prospecting and be working on the next deal. And what Mark showed me was, hey, look, all of these jokers out here sell one, two, three houses and they act very important and they're not doing anything and they're they're meeting their letters for lunch and they're meeting their title companies for dinner and they they dress up and they sound busy, but I'm gonna show you how, like what it takes. So what I would do is I, you know, the, probably 10 of the most important things I learned was one, you know, call your clients. You have to know your list, you have to know how many people are on your list, how many clients you have. You'll ask a bad agent how many clients they have, and they'll be like, oh, I got a Roll maps here. I got some people on my phone. I got this over here. I got a zip drive. You have to know exactly how many clients you have, and that that's done through constant contact. It's very inexpensive. I want to say it's sixty nine dollars a month. I make it a, a point to still do two constant contacts per month. I add ten people to my general list per week, um, and you, your client base will continue to grow because everybody that, that knows a realtor, they know ten of them, and. It's whoever's in front of them when, when it comes time to list or comes time to sell, it's whoever they remember the last time. So I'm trying to touch them twice a month with something silly. It's going to be a family post one, one time. It's going to be a business email the next time. It's going to be a promotion the next time. It'll be a vacation after that. So I try to do a lot of constant content. The other things are the old things that still work. I, I'll never forget ABC. Three, two, one. So you basically put a list of where your clients sit and where your, your sphere is. So your A list are people that are always going to use you. Your mom, your aunt, your grandma. Your B list is your neighbor, your your boss. Your C list is the guy that's four houses down, or the people, the, the guy at the chamber that you talk to every once in a while. Well, the three, two, one is your age. You only have to call them, physically call them every three months. You only have to call your grandma every three months and remind them that you're a realtor. <laughs> they, they probably are going to use you anyways. The bees, you only have to call every two months. That's your next door neighbor. Just say, hey, uh, whatever whatever holidays come up at. You know, hey, Memorial Day is coming up. Are, are you doing anything for the Indy 500 or do you do anything for the Kentucky Derby? Just let you know I'm still an agent. If you need me or if you know anybody who needs me, give me a call. Your, your C's, you have to call every single month. You have to get them into a better category. You want to get your, your C's to B's and your B's to A's. So he taught me that a long time ago. What I would do is all this windshield time I had driving from Valpo to Marigo to Hammond, I would just start my list and I would just call. I would just literally go through my voicemail or my my, my uh, 
my phone list and just call people and wish them a happy Valentine's Day, remind them that I'm an agent. Wish them a happy, happy St. Patrick's Day, remind them I'm an agent. So that's what I do with that. Red X is very important. It's an expired lead service. I would call Red X every Thursday night from 6 to 8 p.m. It's expired listings and say, hey, look, I know you've had probably a million jokers call you to relist your home, but I want to find out where you're heading. Are you heading to Florida? And they would all laugh. Like, I'm calling a lady from Maryland, I'll ask her if she's going to Florida. She'd say, no, 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 I'm, I'm moving to St. John. Well, I know you got this handled, um, but can I help you with your, your buy? And you basically are interested in their buy to help them go look for homes. Once that happens, they say, well, I got this house to list. Can you help me sell it? So I would make a ton of money off of expired because most people that call expired say, hey, I saw your last realtor. They suck. Your pictures suck. Your, your house sucks. That's why I didn't sell. You need to drop the price. Hire me because I've worked at the best broker ever. And, you know, I'm going to sell the house for you. They don't want to hear it. They want to hear I ask them how their last agent did. I, if I get them rolling and get them getting mad about their last agent, I know I got them. Um, but I talk about the future. Where are you headed? Let me help you with that. I'm not, I'm not interested in your house, but the second you take them out one time and they don't fall in love with something, they're going to ask you how I get this thing back on the market. You're going to be right there. So Red X is extremely important. We did a lot of events. I did a client party every November. I'd buy a bunch of beer. I'd buy hay bale. We had a big fire. All those client parties turned into business every single time. Um, I would do farmer's markets. I would do uh, chamber events. I, I, anywhere that I could go for free, I would do it. So I just did a lot of old school things that most people aren't doing. Most people won't, will only send a text or they'll only email. They're scared to have a conversation on the phone. I made a lot of money from hard conversations and it's it's on the phone. Uh, I talk to Isaac about this all the time. Isaac's a beast on the phone now. He's not even 21 yet. But he's out there calling people saying, hey, this is what I'm trying to accomplish. This is what I'm trying to do. And it works because most people aren't going to do it. You got those, you know, you got those new agents, the, the 22 year old females that just want to text and Instagram. And it, it, everybody's doing that. It, you can blend in, you know, so get on the phone and make the, make the work. That's good. Any, any questions on that? I think that was that was really excellent. Any questions? I, I, I love the ABC analogy. Um, I forgot the guy's name, uh, but I, I read this in a business book many years ago. He said, all your employees are A, B, or C employees. Like A's are your rock stars, B's are the people that can be rock stars, and C are going to be your ducks that are never going to be eagles. But like you might need them around, you might not, but you should always be replacing your C's with B's or A's. So uh, it's kind of the same thing when it comes to clients, um, you know, in, in there. So I, I think that that's really good. I, I do remember a lot of, I, I know in the first couple of years, we probably did four or five lunches. Yeah. Um, so like, don't be afraid to go shake hands, go take people to lunch, you know, you know, talk to them, remind them you're a realtor, ask them, you know, about their life and what do they think about things and get them, and you and have especially to, somebody to be influential. We have to get in front of people that can make you money. The reason why I was sitting with Tom is because Tom can make me a lot of money. If you sit with a lender, a lender's not going to make any money. The lender is sitting with you because you will make them money. Yeah, so right. you have to get in front of, you know, divorce attorneys. You have to get in front of, you know, fire stations, police stations. All these people that are very loyal and will, will use you and you can make money that way. You know, I tell all my agents right from the get-go, all these lenders are going to call you to take you to lunch. You, 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 couldn't, you couldn't spend your time worse. It's just, it doesn't make any sense to do that. So um, just get in front of people that can make you money. That's good. That's good. Um, okay, so um, we talked about what you did, and no questions. Come on, yeah. guys. This is this is the time. Have, go ahead. What was uh, what do you think was uh, a big turning point for you from the first six months to the uh, second six months? Zero to yeah. So it's consistency. Uh, it takes time for your family and friends to know that you're legit and that you're serious about it. I get so many people that. Get in the business and they're out on month five, you know, and it's like they got to know that you're for real. You know, I got some agents that sell Sensi, they're nurses, they're agents, they're volunteer firefighters. Their sphere don't know what they do. They don't. They don't know what they're doing. So I think uh, after six months of continuous, just consistency of letting people know what you're trying to accomplish. That that's the only difference between a good agent and a bad agent. The good agent lets people know what they're trying to accomplish. A bad agent keeps it a secret. And out of 650 people, I have many that don't keep it a secret, and I have many that 
No one, nobody has any idea they're going to do it. And they, they struggle. So at, after six months, people realized that, hey, man, Kevin's really got some, some things going. I was checking into closings. I was doing Facebook Live. I was doing Instagram stuff. I was doing stuff all over LinkedIn. You know, so I was just doing exactly what the guy that was in charge of me was telling me to do. I just stayed consistent with that. I bought a little tights playhouse and spray painted it. The company colors, which at the time were maroon and white. And I was sitting at the end of our subdivision, handing out sticker bars with my business card on it with a soul sign nailed to the little types. And it's stupid, but it, everything works. You just have to do something. Most people don't do anything. They just they just wait for their grandma to call over. <laughs> it just it just it's not going to happen. So you know the average agent nationwide sells eight homes a year. That's that you're going to struggle. Um, it has an eighty-two percent failure rate, and that's why. It, if people put themselves out there and let people know what they're trying to do, usually your people want to help you. Some don't, but most of your family and friends want to see you succeed. Good. Anybody else? All right, cool. Um, anything else you want to you know? So I remember you giving this, and I'm not sure if you'll give it the way you gave it last time that I heard you say this or not, but you talked about your elaborate social media plan. Do you remember that? No. Every morning you get out? Oh, yes. So okay. uh, I, I don't do the same thing, um, but I have taken myself off of four out of five of those things. Um, I tell my agents in the five minutes that it takes you to drink a cup of coffee, put all the apps right in a row. LinkedIn, which is really important. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Snap. And we have a social media girl every morning that creates content for us. I tell all my agents, steal her content that she, she puts it out for us to take. And in the five minutes it takes you to drink your, your coffee, post that same graphic on all five apps. And, and people know you're still alive. They know you're still out there. They know you're a realtor. They know you're doing it. Um, because people that just post on Facebook, that's a 35 to 50 age group. You know, LinkedIn is, is a little different. Instagram is younger. You know, TikTok's even less. And so... We are doing that all the time. I encourage everybody else to do it now. Currently, I've taken myself off of every single thing except for Facebook, which I love TikTok. I'm so addicted to TikTok, but I I had to take myself off of it. Um, but exactly. <laughs> Facebook's left. So I hired a branding manager. Um, she's gonna be she's gonna be me, and I'm gonna be completely off social media. So um as soon as the second that she gets as good as me, I will no longer be on Facebook. You get that? So open up your Facebook every morning, open up your apps and just make it happen on every single And, and honestly, awesome. consistency is the key when it when it comes to that. Like if you just do it once a week, it's just not enough. You gotta stay in front of people. And people think it needs to be earth shattering content. It just has to be content. It has to be just people letting people know what you're trying to do. It could be a logo, it could be your company logo. If you post it, at least it, it clicks and they say, Hey. He's still doing it, you know, because they don't know. Them. They they just don't. They, they know ten people that sell, and they're gonna they're gonna remember the last one that they got in front. Yeah, I, I think that's that's really important um, advice there. So I think you know he said consistency. It's like every day, make sure you do that. These whatever these ten tasks or whatever whatever you're gonna make yourself do, um, and then kind of like so like what? And I'm not sure. Again, I we we didn't script this at all, guys. So like sure. this is really off the cuff. Um, I think one of the most important things, but also one of the hardest things on um, being an entrepreneur and building a business is hiring people. Yeah. Um, so just give me some advice on, on you so, know, what do you think about hiring people? What, what, what's your philosophy on that? I have nine really full time staff members, um, and every single one of them are 10 times smarter than me. Um, Isaac, I'm going to bring up Isaac again. He got his license when he was 18. Um, he is a beast, and he's not even 21 yet. Uh, Kayla's been running our show since she was 18. She's now 26. She runs the entire company. Um, you know, I have a content girl that's amazing that I recruited from somewhere else. I have another girl that I recruited from somewhere else. She is doing branding. She's amazing. Uh, Valerie was a, um, she was working at the same company forever. Got her. She's, a, she's incredible. So, I mean, every single person, um, I try to treat them right. I try to pay them right. And uh, they are they're so much better at everything. I delegate every single thing that I'm not good at, which is pretty much everything. So I, 
they're all doing everything in the business. I'm not doing um, very much at all. Uh, I've, I've probably almost over automated it. I could literally leave for two years and no one would have any idea where I was. And, and, and it wouldn't matter. So um, these people are extremely good. Um, I hope they stay forever. I pray they stay forever. Um, but they are they are the real deal. So um, along those lines, so something I do know that you're good at, because I've seen it in, in action, hiring agents. So I know some of you guys are agents. Maybe you might aspire to be a broker at some point. Maybe you want to build your own you know, brokerage at some point. Like, Give some wisdom and your thoughts. I've seen him do this, and he, I'm telling you, he's a master when it comes to So I, I do a lot of recruiting. Um, I spend almost seven days a week at Fluid Coffee and Bethel uh, recruiting. And uh, my thought is, the, the business is 85% part-time people. Any any broker that says, oh, we're all full-timers is, is lying. It's, it's 85% part-time nature. So uh, what I what I think is everybody brings a certain dynamic to a brokerage. They, they all bring some type of value. They may not light up the world. They may be amazing for content. They may be amazing for culture. They may be, may be great at helping others. They may be great at getting the word out. Um, I've tried to recruit Carmen for 10 years because I, I know that she is, she's good at telling people what she does. She's good at letting you know how she feels. She's good at letting you know where she works. So uh, I need I need people like that. So every single person I sit in front of, um, they have some type of value to my company, whether it's, whether it's branding, it's sales, it's culture, it's guidance. So I can usually determine what that is and try to help them with that. And I just try to find out their goals. Everybody's goals are different. Some people want to light the world up. Some people want to sell one house a year and pay for Christmas presents on, at the end of the year. Some people want to do eight deals a year and, and just have some more you know, free time and free money. Um, everybody's goals are different, but everyone's strengths are different as well. It's, it's, it's crazy how different everyone is, but... Um, that's how we get people. We just try to find out what they want. I try to find out what the current problem is that, is that they're existing brokerage. And I try to figure out a solution for that. I take all the negative feedback. I, see, I, I try to figure out if you're ahead of the fit. Um, and I try to figure out what I can do to make them want to stay and not leave us. I don't want to mess that up. I don't want you to come here and hate it and then leave You know, six months later. So um, I'm in those appointments every day. I try to let them do 95% of the talking. I calculate it, figure out what they're trying to do and try to have a solution for them. Sometimes I don't have a solution, but most of the time I do. And uh, we just figure it out from there. So let, let me give you this on like from the other side. Okay, so have you, have you ever been like a fish and you know that you're on the hook and you know somebody else has got you and like, but you, you just, I don't know, you just end up going along for the ride, right? Because you're, you're, you're that. So that was me. Now, I'm not an agent. My wife is actually the, the agent in the brokerage, but like me and my wife are kind of like a package deal. Um, so, I mean, I was one of those people that he recruited. And I can tell you, like, the way the way he made me feel, and I think this is what we, this is what I'm trying to get across here. It's like, the way he made me feel was like if if he could solve my problem and if he could like make it, he was really trying to figure out how it, it could work for me. So like trying to hire agents, if you're a broker and you're like, I want to hire these, these agents, if you could make it work for them and then it still works for you, well, then th that's kind of how he made me feel. That's how he made me, you know, me and my wife feel like, hey, like I'm going to make this work for you, whatever it takes, like we're going to we're going to make it work. Um, and I, I just want to let you know that I don't think I've ever told you that. But like um, to me, I felt like I feel like this guy's got my back. This guy really cares about me. He was willing to listen to, you know, maybe what we did or didn't like. And my wife is a person that like back. I don't think, I don't think she's doing this many deals. Not, but she was doing 100 transactions in yeah. a year. So like Kevin was highly motivated to get Becky. You know, yeah, she did 91 deals. This year. Yeah. And last year, she didn't even feel like she did it, had a, a good deal. I mean, a big. And that's part time. She works full time in her business. So, um, uh, but uh, but anyway, so I, I just want to let you know that I appreciate that um, and how you make people feel when you're doing that. And you did a good job with that. Um, anything else you want to go on the business from any questions? Any questions on that next level business? There to me, I feel like one of the most important things is recruiting, building culture, um, and all that. Um, when it comes to real being a real business owner, I saw your hand first. Yeah. There. You mentioned that the gentleman about the 21. Yeah, the closest. You got any of the kind of the art age group too? 
Yeah, so our age group is, we, we, have, we have everything. I've had a, um, I, I just had a lady that I got into a big fight about. Um, we had a huge fight. Uh, back in 2013, I was doing buyer's agency agreements. So um, me and a couple of my buddies were, were doing some deals and um, I was sick of getting paid two and a half percent on the buy side. So I was firing off these buyer's agency agreements and basically getting three percent on every deal on the buyer side. And she thought it was legal and she had her manager broker call me and yell at me. And after she found out that it was legal, she we got the deal done and then I recruited her. Her name's Lynn Gant. She was one of my favorite ladies and she was with us all eight years. She just retired uh, this year. Um, I've had a couple of agents pass away. I've had four agents pass away. Um, but we're probably, you know, Isaac was 18 to 75, you know, so. Um, Are you inside that? Are you inside that group there? Eight, 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 18 to 75 or somewhere? Oh, oh. In the group. <laughs> and here's the thing, they all do. Yeah, I mean. We don't think that the young people don't yes. know. We have the wisdom and experience. They have all the tech. Yep. They have the energy. They have the, the need to know and the knowledge. They want to get yep. out of here. I've tried to get, you know, Mitzi Wiggenroth, who's been in Berkshire. She's up there in age, and I've tried to get her. I mean, they all can bring some kind of value. There's, there's some value there. You just have to be a good judge of character, and I'm really good at figuring that out, like what, what kind of value they can bring. And but it's all ages. I mean, we have we have nine school cranking out people now. We get every age group in the school. So it, to answer your question, then there's been anybody over here. Question over here. Yeah, how did you work out the franchise design? Oh, <laughs> it was a tough year. So. Um, in 2000 and uh Wait, are they franchises now yes okay. yes well like franchises the license yeah. franchises <laughs> so in 2018 the agent of the year in southwest michigan called me and said hey i want to i want to go over to michigan i'm like well i don't want to open in michigan i'm, I'm just want to be good here she's like well how about you create something and sell it to me and i'll i'll do that so i'm like oh okay so i Hired a bunch of really smart attorneys and we created licensee agreements for um, 11 different companies. So they were expanded across from Michigan and Illinois. And we were good. Well, then the state said we weren't good. And this was in 2019. And uh, I said, well, what do I have to do to get good? And they said, this is what you have to do this, 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 and this. So uh, we just worked our butts off and looked. I had four different attorneys, uh, and we were good with the state. The state said we were great. Um, so we're great. Right, licensing. Yeah, yeah, licensing. So we were great. Uh, off to the races. Then we do 11 of these agreements, 10-year agreements. And then I got an email. I got a subpoena. I got a um, cease and desist. I got everything you could possibly get um, in June of last year that hey you're no longer compliant we want you to be this so i'm like oh boy like i was on my boat i was actually up in northern wisconsin and i got the email and i almost dropped my phone because i knew what it was and i knew what i had to deal with four years before then and uh i instantly parked the boat we drove home six hours um i hired uh, they actually went after my attorneys, the original four attorneys. And so they fired me and said, hey, we, gotta, we can't work with you anymore either. So I hired the best attorneys um, in Indianapolis. There were seven eighty an hour. Um, and it took me from June 23rd um, of 2023 till November 10th to convert all to franchise. So um, so how long before they say that you need to go back to land? I don't know. Hopefully you got good. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I'm like one of those dogs that, you, that was beaten and you pet them and they flinch with before you pet them. Um, I always think it's something else is coming, but, you know, it's the way they wanted it and I had no choice. So, um, so are, you, are you dealing with several different states or is it more like just an Indiana? Different deal? states, yeah. So I... Um, it's an FPD document. It's a 45 page packet, custom written for your style of business. Um, to be quite honest, the 
debt industry we use, they're the, they're the best. Um, but the best franchise attorney actually is Indiana licensed and lives in Louisville. So we hired them, um, put it all together, but it is so much work. And now I don't, now I understand why there's not a lot of franchise out there. Um, but we had a lot of stuff in place. We had processor that, you know, processor books. We had ownership binders. We had mentorship binders. We had um, the entire, the entire way to open a business from step one to step 100. Everything that they were already looking for, we basically already had. You didn't have that except for to come in and do all of the operations. All of that was done. Kayla did all that. Kayla built it all. Um, so we had all of that. But now it's scary when they say, you know what, you're no longer compliant. You have to do it this way. So uh, they gave us till November 15th uh, last year to finish it. And we finished it on November 10th. So um, it was stressful. It was a it was a really rough year, um, but we got it done, and now it's done, and um, it, it's it's good for until they say it's not good. Um, but we we did everything they told us to. We always have. We've always been compliant. We always wanted to make them happy, um, but it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work, and uh, it's over now. It's finally over. So. Um, Right, we did. Awesome. Unfortunately, being a realtor is a very catty business. So you get a lot of people that get a little, yeah. uh, get their panties in a wad, and then all of a sudden, yeah. It's I mean, from day one, the races. So. From day one, I've gotten attorney general complaints. I mean, from mostly competitors. You know, yeah. just say they beat in the court. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's very and it's way too long. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I've, I've seen it all. I've done it all. I've, I've been through every single. Yeah, it's funny, I was at a mediation and my attorney showed up with shorts and a uh, ball cap on and he actually had to go into court for like a quick little whatever and the judge is like, he's like, you're wearing shorts, you're wearing that. <laughs> uh, anyways, it is, it is what it is. All right, so any, any more quick things on the business? I'm going to kind of switch gears here. Um, anything else on business building or anything else you guys or anything you want to add? Business? Right. Yes, yeah, so we are. We created our first school, Maribel, um, 2017, and now there's nine of them. So uh, there's, you know, this is actually a school too. It's not really going right now, but it's, it's <laughs> we a have school. Um, we have anybody want to teach? St. John, we have Maribel, we, we, we have Tornin, we have Michigan City, we have Mokina. Um, they all run different schedules. So um, we have two uh, online schools. ListingLeaderschool.com or ListingLeadersAcademy.com. Um, so you can take it online. You can do it in person. Pretty simple. It's 10 weeks, 90 hours. We also have, uh, we have an escalated or a, a, a quicker course, which is uh, five weeks, but it's like six hours a day or something. Yeah. So. yeah. All right. So let, let's let's move. Let's uh, switch gears to NAR. Sure. Um, so why don't you just explain like what you know of the situation, what what the whole thing, why it come up with, what's the result, and then what kind of is it gonna actually sure. changes is it gonna actually make so uh you know and I, this is this is just second hand it's still a work in progress but uh, my understanding is that um, the first one to get sued nationwide was Remax. Um, they settled then Keller was next they settled and now they went after NAR and NAR settled. And the deal was, hey, look, if we settle, you can no longer go after all of these other guys. So they kind of laid on the sword for all the other brokerages, brokers, managing brokers, all of that. So a lot of people were mad at NAR because they settled, but I think it's actually a good thing because it puts an end to it. Um, they had to pay 400 and something million dollars in the settlement, and it has to be uh, in effect, July 1st. So um, basically now... Um, what was the lawsuit? Could we just restart? Uh, the lawsuit, I believe, was um, co-inspiring uh, back-end commission where they, they, they felt that seller didn't know that they were paying the list side commission and the buy side commission. So um, that's what they... That's what they talked about was the issue. Starting July 1st, there will not be a commission offered on the buy side um, publicly. So what I've talked about, what I've heard, or what I've gone through is that buyer's agency agreements will come into effect, fully executed by you and your buyer, and you will write an offer, and 
in the further conditions basically say um, per buyer agent, per fully executed buyer's agency agreement, seller should compensate buyer's agent blank. Um, some will, some won't. Um, it will be negotiable. If they're not already offering. If they're not already offering. Sure. Yeah. So, so I, we, the most interesting thing to me about this whole entire case was I think there was two main points that they were trying to make against realtors and the way everything's been going down. First of all was what you just mentioned. And second of all, they were saying that it was um, it was intentionally inflating real estate prices and it was going to cost more money for it's making it cost more money for buyers. So it was like poor, poor, pitiful buyers that the buyers are having to pay more money, not even thinking in my mind that, oh, the, the buyers don't have to pay this commission. Um, so today it sounds like to me that now the buyers are now negotiating from a completely different standpoint. Buyers are now negotiating from, I got to pay real estate commissions. You know, so instead of, you, 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 does that make sense? Yeah. So it really doesn't make it more affordable at the end of the day for the buyers. In my opinion, it probably hurts the buyers. Exactly. It definitely hurts low income. It hurts veterans. You got it. So to, to like, in my opinion, it hurts them from the standpoint of where they're starting to negotiate. Now, what you brought up and what I think you believe is that what most people will probably do is just like the seller is gonna, instead of offering it on the way that they were offering it in like the realtor splits, they're probably gonna say, you know, in the further conditions, because it's funny because I actually think that NAR was really smart about how they presented this and they were like, but I mean, they actually put that in their conditions yeah. that they can still offer this in the further conditions. Yeah, I mean, this is something that we were doing in 12, 13 and 14 to increase buy outside commission from two and a half to 3%. So now that all these commissions have gone from three to 2.75, 25, 20, 1.5, now on these fully executed by the agency commission documents, we're putting 3% on there. So it's an opportunity for buyer agents to actually make more money. Um, I have never presented one of those buyer agency agreements with an offer to a seller and they say no to a good offer when I say that I need to pay them, you know, the buyer's agent. So, um, but it does. So, does it not though give the seller the opportunity to negotiate absolutely. and say, no, I'm only willing to pay 2.5? Absolutely. So, like, and then you just it is a negotiation at that point. Yeah. Everybody's got to feel is this good for me or not? So. It's going to be on a case by case basis. Yeah. Uh, multiple offers, it might be rough on the buyer's agent. Yeah. Uh, but on a street where there's five houses for sale and Bill of Shores and over. If you know one person's accepting three percent commission, the other person's not offering a co-op, that other house is probably going to sell faster. So you just never know. I think it's an. Op I think people hate change. Mm -hmm. I think it's an opportunity to pivot and make more money. I think it, it's gonna it's gonna eliminate a lot of um, people even doing anything because a lot of times whatever that buyer's commission is, the buyer's agent just accepts it, whether it's one percent, two percent, one and a half. Now it gives you the point to actually spark the negotiation higher to where you're in the game. Back then, people don't even know that they can do a buyer's agency agreement and they just accept what they accept. So instead of making 2% on a deal, a lot of these agents are really making 3%. So let me ask you this. So, well, well, two questions. First of all, do you think it's actually going to lower the price of roasting? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, second of all, um, um, what what do you think the, the most likely outcome of the whole thing is? Like, I think the most likely outcome is it's, we're going to be a little bit more transparent as agents, which is always good. I think the clients want transparency. Um, I think that it's going to just be another negotiating tool. Uh, but I think in the long run, it's going to not change the market whatsoever. It's going to actually get buyers, agents paid more. Um, so and I, I just purchased a home in Las Vegas last June, and I couldn't even book a flight to buy a house. And the second I saw it, and it appeared, by the time I hop on the plane, by the time it lands, it's gone. So, um, you know, houses are going to sell no matter what, but agents are going to get paid no matter what. So, I know. So, all in all, it's probably not going to, it's going to be mostly business as usual with more disclosure. It's more disclosure, more transparency. It's one more piece that we're going to have to negotiate. Uh, it's a conversation with your buyer up front saying, hey, look, I'm going to have to have you sign this document. This is what my services cost. I'm going to do absolutely everything to have the seller pay for this cost. But if they don't, 
then we're going to have to have a tough conversation if you find something you fall in love with. So um, there are going to be deals you get burned on, you're not going to make anything. And I, but I think those are very few and far between. Um, I just think that the market has shifted more to a buy side market anyways, to where, you know, if you're 64 days on market and someone sends you a 3%, um, you know, buyer's agency agreement, they're going to take it before you can even email it. So I think it's, I think it's an opportunity for agents. I think it's good for the sellers. I think it's great for buyers. I think it's great for agents. I think it's great for the industry. It's gonna, it's just one more curtain that's unveiled to where we are more transparent and more trustworthy. Do you think this is gonna change any of the MLS or any of the like? Uh, the MLS is- What do you call it? The, the uh, um, uh, <laughs> NAR, I mean, not NAR. Um, like I, I, IRM, IRMLS, like what was like what, what was that called? NARM? Yeah. I mean, they won't be able You're to right show now. BAC on them. Um, but that's the weird part about it. It's like we're playing Secret Squirrel. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's. It's it was. Yeah. Right. But it didn't for when I started, it did. It just showed the commission. Now it shows what you pay the the, the buyers. Yeah. Other, other states too. It doesn't show. Yeah. The, the, remember this. This is a national thing, and a lot of the associations weren't as transparent as we are in Indiana. So it affects other states differently. differently. They're gonna, it's going to be way more of a change for other states. Um, when I purchased a house in Wisconsin, so many different things. You know, the, the buyer pays every single closing cost no matter what. And um, earnest money is in the form of a check. Uh, they don't take wires. Uh, they don't do anything. So every state's different. But for us, I, I don't think it's going to change much at all. I think it's... Yeah, in Florida, like the seller's disclosures are like six pages long. Yeah. Like, what in the world? Yeah, they also accept the uh, post-dated checks if the seller agrees. Yeah. So do you think that we'll see more rentals compared to first-time home buyers? Because like a limited income, I'd say the first yes. time I can't afford it, I have to rent for another... Maybe. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I mean... And here's, the, here's the thing that Americans do. They, they, they're really good at spending. Yeah. I mean, they'll, if they're approved for 450, they're going to spend every bit of it. You don't ever get many buyers that are approved for 450 that spend 225. So um, it's crazy what prices are. I mean, but everything's expensive. Chicken, you know, meat, clothes, houses. You're just going to have to understand that the, the cost of of what you used to be able to afford changes. You know, when I went out shopping in Vegas, it, a house here that's 350 is a million one there. You know, a lot of a vacant lots 450, you know, and you can't even dig a basement in it. It's just just rock, you know. So um I think that people just have to come back down to reality that hey, a three hundred thousand dollar house isn't gonna look like it like it did, you know. I mean, when I first started in real estate in 2012 and at that you could buy five houses for 2500 bucks total you know i, I remember before we had houses for 500 bucks a piece now you can't buy a house in gary for under 30 right i mean and you're seeing completely done houses ARVs are 278 315 um in certain parts of gary houses are selling over 300,000 now so um you just can't afford what they used to but they're going to have to get used to it i just think that Prices are never going to come down. Inventory is low. Inflation's here. Um, cost of building a home is different. Cost of goods are different. I just think that with interest rates where they're at, which are still historically low, when you look at the entire picture and what houses cost, it's just it's less affordable. But people are going to understand. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions on the NAR? Any more questions on that? I wanted to make sure we we, we talked about that. I thought there was something in the agreement that might affect. The actual um, local clubs or the local whatever the can I are you know I are like for some reason I was thinking that there was something that everything that I gathered is, that but is it, I, 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 I'm sh there's still a work in progress July first is a long time away uh, and I'm sure things will change but um, I'm not worried about it none of my people are worried about it we communicated it very well to them um, and it just seems like it's just going to be a a change, which you know, you have to adapt. What worked last year didn't work this year. What works this year won't work next year. Yeah. All right. Cool. Any other questions? I, Go ahead. I have a statement. I was at a government affairs committee meeting today, and um, we had a guy from NAR that zoomed in, 
And uh, the, the challenge that we have to figure out now, or they're trying to figure out is how, when you have a first time home buyer that doesn't have enough money to put down, historically we've been selling them homes by the seller offering concessions, yeah. but there are limits based on the type of loan mm -hmm. in terms of how much percentage the seller can offer them. You so if they need three, but they can't afford you, then that's a problem. So, and VA is even worse. Yes. Yeah. So, um, and maybe they're working with the VA, they've sent a letter to the VA, you know, so that's what we have to work out on the national level is lenders are gonna have to say, hey, we're not gonna put these limits anymore, go nuts. And maybe at one point, you know, Buyer's agent concessions are in the low, you know, as a concession. It hasn't happened that way, but I think that people are just worried, really worried about nothing. I don't really think it's that big of a deal. I, I really think that uh, once July 1st hits, it's going to be business as usual. People were so worried about it up in arms for two or three days, and then a partner should be the bridge. So, so, what are, so what are the main changes? Like, like I know there's the one change with the buyer's agency agreement. Is there any other changes that, that, that is going to happen That's, between now and the buyer's agency agreement is the Indiana law? Yeah. That's not part of our. Yeah, it's it's IAR. So um, buyer's agency agreement is basically identifying what a buyer's agent charges for their services. So as long as that sign, you can put that in further conditions on the purchase agreement. And um, negotiate it that way. But I, I, I really think that's the only real change is being transparent on the front end, being transparent on the back end, and using that as a negotiation tool. So there, there's no other changes then? The bigger issue in our industry is we need more homes built. Sure. Historically, yeah. we are so underbuilt. And so I see an opportunity in places like Gary, places like Hammond, places like East Chicago, where younger people, they like urban environments. They're not cuckoo like us, like they don't want to live next to this person or that person. You know, they like to catch the train and take a bus and do all those similar sure. things. So it's an opportunity for somebody that can figure out how to build a house reasonably, a small house yeah. yep. on a spot lot. Well, here's the other thing in there. I'm yeah. right there with you. Like, well, here's the other that's, problem. that's literally in our next year or two like plans so we have the builder of the year and you guys are all invited we have the builder of the year um coming to listing leaders in maryville tomorrow i believe at 11 11 o'clock dan steiner's coming and you'll learn a lot about that because the cost of building is yeah. so much right now um you know a house that used to be able to build for 225 is 600 you know a house that was 600 is a million so um you know cost of lumber and you know, conduit and pipe and wire, it's just crazy. So, um, yeah, he's he's dealing with that. Dan is shifting more to like multi unit and to townhouses and paired villas and things like that. You're going to see a lot more of that, but he'll tell you the same thing. It's, it's a lot, it costs a lot to build right now. Mm -hmm. But that's an advantage for places that I mentioned too. It's come down, but it's not that valuable. Sure, exactly. So no, 100%. You got it. Cost on land. And then you got the area. Paying five percent, yeah, the, the cost of the dirt is important, yep. uh, but Got you know, concrete's expensive and labor's. Yeah, all right, one more question. We're going to move on to rentals, right? Right, right. From, from the topic that you're talking about, when you talk with uh real estate investors and they start coming, well, let's do some subjects too, and lease options. How do you? Oh, man, I'm, I'm, uh, as an agent, as a broker, I don't really get much of that. Like, I don't, I don't get any of that, to be honest. Uh, I don't even get those calls. I don't get those questions. That's probably more for like an investor meet up here. Um, you know, I know a lot of guys do really well with that. Uh, uh Jalen, who's at Listing Leaders Premier, does really well with that. Um, I know Danny Gonzalez does a lot of that. I'm sure Tom and Becky do a lot of that stuff. So, um, that's probably more for like a, a deep investment type meeting, uh, but I've never, I've never personally done a subject to, um, I, I know it's really good and assumable loans are great, uh, but I haven't really had to deal with it, to be honest. Yeah, that's a whole other topic for another day. So yeah. I'm not going to, I'm and not going to go down that rabbit really, trail. People are really good <laughs> at it. It's just not me. I'm not good at it. Yeah. So, so let's move on to, to your rental portfolio. Let's just give me your, your philosophy on rentals and how, what you built and like sure. anything anybody should give on. Uh, so you're going to, when you're at these meetings, you're going to hear a lot of um, burn uh, techniques and a lot of 
uh, lenders and leverage and things like that. And that is a great way to do it. Um, it's probably the smartest way to do it, to be honest with you. Um, I just haven't done it that way. So um, when I was selling baby clothes and when I was making money on real estate commissions, I would collect money. And once I had enough money to buy a rental, I went and bought. And uh, over the course of from 2014, when I bought my first rental in Villa Shores and Hobart um, until today, um, I have 47 doors uh, that are paid for. Um, that's uh, basically me getting a license, me taking a commission check and living off of what I currently was making and taking every single commission dollar and putting it into buying real estate. So that's currently what I do is I, I, I every dollar that I make out of brokerage is used to purchase real estate. I found a deal this morning. I told everyone I'm not buying a single house in 2024. And when that, when you say that, that's when all the deals fall right in your lap. And I've been driving past this Peppies. There's a Peppies in Valpo. I've driven past it a million times. It's been closed for three years. Uh, I've called the owner. I've begged the owners, sell it to me, sell it to me, sell it to me. It got listed three hours ago, and my hands have been shaking ever since because I want it. So um, I just basically got my license, took commission dollars, bought rentals, and um, never dealt with a bank. I've never dealt with any of that stuff. Everything I own is paid for, um, and I just go that route. Other people that you'll hear speak here, you know, Al's great at it. Um, you know, there's so many people that are doing it really well where they, you know, buy, was it buy, rehab, rent, rent and then refinance. refinance. Repeat. It, repeat. It works. It works amazing, and people, my brother Mark does that. Um, it, it works really, really well. It's just something that I didn't want to have to be organized and paying bills and paying mortgages and doing things like that. I thought, hey, I'll just have less of them. And over time, I'll buy as many as I can. I try to buy stuff that's junk and try to make it nice and um, and then rent it out. And over the course of the year, I tell people, get one or two You know, every year. If you buy one or two a year, time flies by so fast. I mean, I met Tom 10 years ago. It feels like yesterday. Before you know it, in 10 years, you have 20 routes that are paid for. So the moral of the story is go get your real estate license, sell some houses, buy some rentals, and Happen. Yeah, I mean, he says this may not be the smartest way, but I think that there's two different ways to kind of look at building a rental portfolio. I mean, and to me, it's like you can go like the only thing that he's not getting by doing it this way is he's not getting the appreciation on more doors. In my opinion, that's the only benefit that he's missing out on. Um, but what he's gaining, on my opinion, is peace of mind. He doesn't have to ever worry. The only person that can take that house away is if he doesn't pay the taxes. Like, sure. You don't really ever own your houses, by the way, because the government owns it all. Anyways, uh, but uh, <laughs> so really the only bill he has to pay is taxes every single year. But if he if he owns them free and clear, like his average rental, that leverage would make you two, three, four hundred dollars a month. He's making eight, nine, a thousand dollars a month on every single one of those rentals. Um, they, uh, so, I mean, to me, like you could have less doors and have less headache and have less potential problems and less lawsuits and less whatever, or you can go and do like, I know a guy in California, he's got 160 doors and he probably has about the same cash flow as Kevin does. Yeah. The only thing that Kevin's missing out on is the fact that, well, now these are going to also appreciate yeah. over a long period of time. I mean, when COVID hit, you didn't know what was going to happen. What were people, were the people not going to pay their rent? Were they going to pay their rent? We had no idea. I mean, real estate went crazy good after that, you know, and um, so you just don't know. But to me, it's a risk tolerance thing. Like, if your risk tolerance is low, you really should be thinking cash, like, let's just take and, cash. And I'm the biggest warrior there is, and I'm a yeah. scaredy cat. So, I mean, that's just the way that I do it. My brother does burr, and he does really, really well. Uh, you know, Al is buying 100 units every three days and he's doing just fine. You know, he's driving around in a Ferrari. So I'm sure that works perfect too. It's just, uh, the cool thing about that is bonus depreciation, which is a whole other topic, which is amazing. But in 15 years, all of all of his property here, he worth double because right. they appreciate it. Yeah. And he's going to have millions and millions of dollars, you know? So all that stress, all that stress paid off. Uh, I'm just not willing to take on the stress. So when you're talking about investing in real estate, 
do you think at a certain age you should not handle rentals? Like I'm 63. I feel yeah. like I should, I'm too old to be working on rental properties. I yeah. feel like if I'm gonna buy real estate, I buy a, a dump and flip it. Yeah. Uh I, I did I flipped for a long time. I flipped for probably three years straight, and it wasn't for me. I know it's more exciting, it's funner, it's more exciting. Um for me, I like buying a rental, fixing it, making it nice, putting in the, the address on a dry erase board downstairs, but dry like driving by them. Okay. Um so I don't financially. Uh, I, I like the the slow pace of it. I, I like the less stress of worrying about dealing with contractors and dealing with uh -huh. people stealing and and this then I don't I don't deal with any of that. So for you, the, the stress of dealing with renters is less than the stress. The, they're professionally managed now, so I don't deal with any of that. I, I could not my my goal for 2025 is to buy a lot of Michigan City rentals, Gary and Hammond, because I don't self-manage anymore. I'll make it their problem now. So uh, I I have no problem with other people managing it. So I'm not afraid to do anything now. Uh, now that I don't have to deal with right. Basement calls, roof calls, AC calls, tree branches. Uh, uh, it's game on now. Once, once 2025 hits, I'm going to invest like you wouldn't believe. So Kevin's grown since the last time he spoke here because last time he was self managing. It was and I was like, dude, you got to stop doing it this. Uh, but you know what, what? What I will say, what I will say is, um, you know, a lot of our investors like do what he's talking about. Like a lot of our investors buy from us, we rehab for them, we manage for them. So it is really a kind of a hands off you know, process. So a lot of our investors that buy from us, like we sell them a property wholesale, we fix it up for them. And then we manage for them on the back end. It's really like doing the active do is like, it's turnkey, active right? Turnkey, that's that's right? part of it. So that's the active turnkey process. It doesn't really, but, but, but I will tell you, um, as people do get older, like what, what, what is kind of a trend with our investor group is like the younger you are, the more you need to leverage. And I do want everybody to understand, like, every time you leverage, you are adding risk to that deal. So just he's eliminating the risk by not getting the lender involved at all. So but so as you as you're younger, the more you say, hey, I only got 20 grand. I want a hundred thousand dollar rental. OK, well, you can leverage that. You can get a loan. But if you don't have a hundred grand, then you can't buy a rental. Yeah, I'm not buying cash. stuff like that. Like, right. like Ferris will come to me and say, hey, I got a. 91 unit for six million dollars. Are you in? I'm like, I'm buying a house for 41 grand <laughs> and so and renting it out for a thousand. You know, so right. I'm just not at their level. I don't I, I don't I, I've met with Al, I've met with Ferris, and I've said, look, guys, it's what you're saying all makes sense, but I don't have the balls to do it, and I don't have the money to do that. So uh, I just know where I fit in, in that and if, I buy junk. I buy junk and I make it nice and then I rent it out and then I collect them. So uh, that's all I do. And, and real estate commission did that for me. So you talk about like the, what is it? The, the turtle wins the race or whatever. Yeah. You know, now, you know, my last 1099 for my property manager was 470,000 last year on rental. So, you know, it's 470,000. It just showed up in a mailbox, you know? So, um, it's just the way I do it. It doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it wrong. Everybody likes different stuff. Everybody likes different areas. I like downtown Valpo and it's all like 1890 built, 1910, wet basements, uh, just garbage. And I love it. I love the garbage. So so what I was trying to say though, like, so I appreciate that. Um, but what I was trying to say is like, the, the more people get older, like what I have seen from a lot of again our investors is they'll switch from being a landlord. They'll start selling their properties. Either they'll go Alicia's model and start seller financing the properties to the tenants and just continuing to kind of be the bank at that point, or they'll sell off their portfolio and then they'll start loaning the money out. Like if they want to stay in real estate, they'll just start being a lender, private lender, and they'll just loan people money on fix and flips or long term on their rentals or whatever. So it kind of makes them be a whole lot less hands off. And you can really scale a lending business because you don't have to worry about contractors or tenants or nothing. Like you just got to go find the deals and 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 build the money. And people people ask like, well, you know, how much are these guys making with commission? Like, I asked my managing broker when I first got my last, what's the most amount of money you made in one month? And he told me and my buddy Todd, who you know, thirty one thousand dollars. I about fell over. I'm like, there is no way you made thirty one thousand dollars in a month. And now I have agents, Susan Mender. I, I, I can name your name. She had eight closings on Wednesday 
And she made thirty thousand dollars a week. And you know that's exactly why they hate us. Well, there you go. And she was a she was a school teacher. She she quit full time right. teaching, and now she's just an agent. So, so that bad. money just she can rack up that. She finished with twenty million dollars last year in sales. So if you take crazy, it, it's it's insane. So she could buy. She's been buying rentals. Um, lots of these guys have been buying rentals. Lots of these agents have been buying buying rentals. And th there's always out there. You know, flippers need that grand slam or that triple. Landlords only need like a single or a double. So you can find those deals on the MLS, and you know you're going to make money over time. But if you fix up a dump to rent it out, you're still dealing with contractors. So what's the difference? Yeah. So I got guys I trust. I got a father son team that I met in uh, 2012. Uh, they were fired by. Uh, an eight a, an investor that I was selling houses to, I said, "Hey, you don't like them, but I really like them." They've had my Home Depot card and my Menards card since 2012. They literally go shop for material, they swipe the card, they do everything. They know what I like, they know the finishes that they like. They they have my you know, you see a listing leader's van drive around. That's them. They've had my van for ever, you know, and that's they just. They they know what they know what to do. So I treat them just like your agent. Yeah. Like love and love and yeah. I went to uh, Alaska with my my family and they finished my basement while I was gone. So I mean it's uh you just gotta find people you trust and you like and treat them well and they they don't want to chase you around for money they don't want to chase you around for materials they have my car go go get go get whatever you want so um, you just have to trust them and and get the right people and, and treat them well. Any questions on rentals, building rental portfolio? Go ahead. So I like like the older but it's like something younger kind of thing. I see about the property manager about this money. At what point right. does it make sense financially to do some more rentals? The point that it made sense for me is I died. I almost died. Um 2022, October 2022, uh, I had uh, kidney failure, heart failure, and lung failure at the same time. So I, you could literally work yourself to death. Um, I was in the hospital for 10 days. Um, my blood pressure was 215, um, over 185 or something like that. Um, luckily, my cardiologist lives next door. Everything's fixed now. Um, but I was self-managing. I was recruiting every day. I was taking every call I could, taking every deal I could. And you can literally work yourself to death. So you just have to focus on what you're good and what you like. Stay in your circle. Delegate. I delegate to the broker side to people that are way smarter than me, and they know they do everything. But on the investing side, I wasn't doing that. I was I was doing everything. You know, I was going to share sales. I was going, you know, looking at houses. I was, I was doing it at all. I was going out and taking calls and people fighting in my property. I had to drag a dead guy from the second floor down to the first floor of the overdose. I mean, so the, there's nothing that I haven't done, but um, at about 40 doors, I was like, man, this is, this is, I can't go buy anymore. Now that I'm, now that they're managed, I'm like, man, I'll go buy and see areas because I don't have to deal with people anymore. So to me, it makes a bunch of stuff. And, you know, I had tenants in there from the day I bought it and I never raised their rent. I'll get seven leases that, oh my gosh, they just raised their rent 75 bucks. I didn't ask them to do that, but the renewal was up and they got $75 more per month on 12 different properties. And I just made an extra thousand bucks, 1500 bucks a month. And I wasn't even asking for. So there's so many things that the property management helps with. And Those are the ways that property management companies actually make you more money in yeah. the long run. I mean, I, I would kind of just say you, you, you got two things to consider. Like, do I have time or do I have money? Like if you got more time, do what you want. Like go and re do them all the, you know, manage them all you want. I would say a good rule of thumb that I've heard from a lot of people is like some people four is their limit, some people ten is their limit, some people's twenty is their limit. I really haven't heard many people that are forty, but Kevin's just like he doesn't like to stop like working. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> but I mean, most people once they get over twenty rentals, that's kind of like a limit for most people. But does that make sense? Well, Any more questions on, on building a rental portfolio? Go we'll in the back. Are you worried about, since you haven't all paid off, any liabilities? Like, you can That's a great question. question. That's a really good question. Yeah, exactly. yeah I'm worried about everything. Um, so, uh, you know, you talk with, well, you talk to an insurance guy, they're going to say, get an umbrella policy. Right. You talk to an attorney, they're going to say, get an LLC. Or a trust. Uh, you talk, or a trust. 
you talk to um, you know anybody else, they're going to say, "Oh, well, this, this is better for taxes." Okay. So I, I don't know. I you know. Have you thought about just putting liens on properties? Uh, I have. Um, I, uh, I've, I've thought about that too. So I've, <laughs> I, I have an, I have an umbrella on all of them. You got it. I'm happy with an LLC, um, and I try to make it to where these things are nice when they get there. I mean, they're not going to get hurt. They're not going to. They're not going to fall over. There's stuff that I would live in, you know. So, yeah, and I treat them well. Like I don't. I got a lady that I bought a. I bought a. I bought a six unit in Valpo for ninety nine thousand, like two years ago, from Sharad, who lives in San Francisco. And uh, I got there. I didn't know anybody, and I and the lady downstairs said, "Hey, are you going to kick me out? I've been here since nineteen eighty five." A little old lady, she said that her husband left, went to China for COVID, and they wouldn't let him come back. Uh, she was paying one sixty five every two weeks. So, you know, to this day, she's still at one sixty five every two weeks. So, you know, you just you gotta show grace for some people and treat them right, treat them like residents. I've learned that one of the top things here: don't call them tenants, call them residents. I think it was Dr. Landlord. I don't know. I mean, I to this day, I don't have anything figured out. I mean, I it's it should learn and try to do the best you can. You know, that, that's a really good question, though. So the ways that I've seen people try to rebuttal that is um, obviously I think LLC is helpful. He actually has you, you also if you don't have, if you're not property managed, you actually have a whole other layer of insurance by having it property managed that you don't have by doing it yourself, and that's E and O. So most property, and trust me, if you hire a property manager, make sure they have E&O. Do not hire them if they don't have E&O insurance. But like, since, since you do a property management company, and I'm sure that they have E&O insurance, um, like he's got a whole extra layer of, of insurance because if they determine that the property manager did anything like wrong or whatever, then there's a whole extra like, and E&O is basically like, you're at fault. So why it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. But you as the owner, leasing your own properties, you can't even buy you know insurance. So like th that that is one thing I as far insurance is really where your real coverage is when everything is you know said and done. Um second of all, an LLC at least a lot of really smart attorneys around the country that I know will say like so maybe true. put a trust on top of your LLCs or maybe even have every single property in their own different land trust. That's another way to kind of um, you know, it, it, it's not protection. Just so you guys know, it's not protection. It just helps attorneys not go after you as much because they're like, oh, like I know all I'm going to be able to get is whatever in this in this in this trust. It does def deter some attorneys. You know, if an attorney is going to choose between taking this case and this case, and this case has got a trust involved, they're probably going to be like, no, I don't, I don't have time for that. And you got I've got an attorney over here shaking his head. Um, so those are those are some things that I would tell you will will help, but making sure and the umbrella policy. So those are the things that you, if you are concerned about. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the one that I mentioned to you. Like you can also put a lien on the property from a wife, from a spouse to or whatever, and you can make it for whatever you want because that will also deter um, attorneys from thinking that you got a bunch of equity in the property. Exactly. The other thing too is it's kind of a fake lien at the end of the day. But it, but it's showing on public record. So when they're pulling it, you got it. But the demand, right, attorney? The, well, I was, like, I was actually going to ask really quick about that. Would a title company typically be okay with you doing that? I mean, the title company doesn't need to have anything part of you putting lien on the yeah. property. You just have to report the lien. Yes, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> Two in Northwest Indiana is for like a single family home. You have 40 tenants for every single family rental. So if demand is that high, they're going to want to stay put anyways, and they're going to want to be in those rentals. So, you know, in downtown Valpo, you can charge whatever you want because people want to be there. So I've had people in there forever that, you know, I don't really think they're going to find a reason to get hurt or to move out because they're they're in, they're, they're where they want to be. They can walk to the splash pad. They can walk to the restaurants. Um, but there's so much demand for a single family home here. That I mean, are they really want to jeopardize moving out over something happening? I try to remind this group of this almost every month, but I want you guys to know we live in like I'm telling you, Lake Porter, Laporte County. This is an anomaly. Like 
the rent to how much you can buy a house for ratio does not exist in these types of areas around the country. Like it really doesn't, unless you're in an area like South Bend and they got to deal with South Bend and they're just horrible to deal with. So don't buy in South Bend. This is my opinion um, as far as rentals are concerned, but uh, great prices. The cash flow looks great on performance, but then when you have to deal with the city, it's not worth the headache. So um, uh, any, any other questions on the rentals? Yes, sir. Fuel of section eight, or no, I just never had to do it. Not that I don't want to, um, I just never have done it. Um, you know, the second we put something up for rent, people went crazy. Uh, I found out really quick once I wasn't self managed that I was under rent, under renting these places, but they got them into ship shape. And you know, these things rent for two grand a month, you know. So, um, I just never tried it. 2025, I probably will, um, because I want to do a lot of cool things in 2025. By 2024, I'm not doing anything. So um, I can tell you, our owners don't like Section 8, and most of our owners will not allow us to rent their properties out Section 8. Um, the local Section 8 office here is not super investor friendly. Um, now, what they list on their website of how much they're willing to pay, like they love to try to get you down on that price, which isn't really what they're supposed to do. Yes. Um, and, uh, so that's part of, that's part of the reason, like if you can get 1350 for a three, one in Gary, which is what they claim that you can get, then I would say go for it, you know, but I will, the, the second part of section eight, that's really bad here is they will not let you raise a rent. Like they will not let you raise. So you better make sure you're over market to start. In my opinion, if you're over market, then so what you got over market for two or three years. And if the tenant stays there for five or six years, then it's probably fine, you know, but if you're going to start in Gary and you're only going to get a thousand when it's really probably more like a 1250 rental. Um, I per like we honestly barely any, I think out of the 500 doors that we manage, we might have like six or eight that are probably section eight. Um, so we don't have very many. And honestly, it's unfortunate because I really think there's a need for somebody to actually like do those deals. So I kind of feel bad for the people that got the vouchers because there's, I'm telling you like, no investor in this area that's knowledgeable that's gone down this trail is actually saying I'll take section eight. So yeah, you if you have somebody looking for section eight, uh John Stuckback who owns off uh off open inspection, he owns a ton of section eight. Yeah, I think it's a need too, because there's a lot of single moms with children and stuff like that that you know somebody's gotta help them. I don't know what the Velpo office is. I, I I don't know where all the other offices around here. I just know the Gary office. Unfortunately, is not. And even the city, the city of Gary actually has a separate program that's outside of Section 8. And I actually think it's worse. Gary Housing Authority just recently like closed down or something. Isn't it all going to County now? I'm not sure. I think it is. You, you might be right. But I just know we haven't accepted that for, yeah. for, for years. Yeah, and we only look for like the East Chicago office or the Hammock office. Okay. And we'll speak to the Gary. I think you said Crown Point as well, one of your Gary rentals. And they were about to be here to work with. I think it's going to take another six months to a year before they get staffed up. Interesting. Yeah. So you can actually go and get a Gary rental out of the Crown Point office. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's, that, that's a good tip. Good to know. What's that? Uh, so I bought a house for $65,000 um, in Villa Shore, probably five years ago. The lady built the house new. And sent all the state in 72, lost it. Um, I bought it from an existing investor. Um, we cleared it out. It was just as bad. It was like an airport. When you open the sliding door, eight mice were coming in and eight mice were leaving uh, with like bags and everything. And uh, we, we, we got it in. We cleared the basement with six dumpsters and a 900 square foot ranch. Um, and then it smelled did not go away. We, Removed all the drywall that didn't help. We removed all the insulation and finally helped. Uh, we took it down with studs, and now uh, we're probably a week away. Um, but you know, I, I'm battling now because I I don't sell off stuff, but we're building a new home, and I'm trying to fund that without a bank. So uh, I'm kind of teetering either selling it or renting it. I hate to sell one, but I I have six of those that are exactly the same and over. That I love, and they never leave. People move from Hobart to Hobart to Hobart. Yeah. They, they, and, they, and their houses are, I think they were Montgomery Warren houses. They have like the one inch walls, and there's one bathroom. The only problem I ever have with them is 
every spring the roots grow into the 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 thing. I rot it and then it's good for a year. So um I haven't decided if I'm gonna sell it or re rent it, but it's doing good. No more mice. That's good to hear. Anybody else? Any more rental questions? Any questions about rental portfolio? Well, uh, huh? uh, to do here is uh, how the peening houses and the modular houses kind of fitting into here. I don't think they've even fit in at all. Like I would say, I do think that modular houses or modular homes could definitely be a way to be able to get new housing stock. I'm not a huge fan of the tiny houses, except unless they're going to be like actually really stick. There's a lot of real stick tiny houses being built in certain areas. I think that could be, you know, a potential at some point. Yeah, you yeah, yeah. An aging mm -hmm. place, and that's okay. you got it. And it's very popular in Florida to have UDI. Yeah. It's in the back. Yeah. Yeah, that there was the, I don't know if it's still there, but there was one on Joliet. No, it's, it's gone now. Yeah. yeah. I think I could do whatever I want. And Gary, I just could go and talk to him and say this is what I want and I could present the plan. Like they really shouldn't like anybody's gonna invest some money in Gary, they really should be willing to work with you. Oh, yeah. But um, I mean, but but like to, you have to think of it like what is this really for? Is this workforce housing? Is this like a fad thing? Like the tiny houses that I've seen are really like two bedrooms. They're literally like two bedrooms, but they're only like 500 square feet and they're like very efficient. Those are the houses that, in my opinion, if I was going to build and I was going to put my name behind, I'd be like, okay, I could do this, but I'm not going to do something where I got to climb on top of them. <laughs> that's, that's probably a question for Dan Steiner tomorrow. I mean, I, I, want, I want that building filled. So, I mean, really, the biggest builders in the country today that are like going gangbusters are the build to rent communities. I mean, they're literally doing build to rent communities all over the place right now. And some of these are some of the smaller homes I'm, that I'm talking about. Um, I'm a part of fam a family office club, and that's like one of the whole funds. If there's like a hundred million dollar fund right now, and all they're doing is building, you know, just like 500 square foot, 600 square foot, little tiny two bedroom. I love I love type of deals. But it hurts my heart when I think of all those big guys just building rentals. Yeah, like I, mean, I, I like where's the American dream going to go? It'll be gone by the time I'm dead, so I guess I shouldn't worry. I hope not. I mean, still, sixty-two percent of people own their house, so I mean, I think we talk a lot about this, but I mean, it kind of yeah. goes back and forth. It's still sixty-two percent of people yeah. still own their house. Like, it is. It is not like. I know that there's been a trend back and forth, but I think that just kind of goes with interest rates. It goes with the economies. I was even talking to Alicia before this. Like, I think a lot of policies, you know, they kind of swing one way and then they got They almost have to swing back. And almost every time, maybe they overcorrect either way. But when as real estate investors, we got to know how to make money in this environment and in this environment and kind of, you know, just, you know. We, we got to just take the punches with, with, with when they come. I, I go to an area which is up north. Um, the one town north, you can buy houses for 15000 20000 22 dollars There's nothing um, there, though. There's yeah. nothing there. There's no interest. You have to be in tech or work from home. Right. Um, but you can buy houses for, I can buy. Um, and that's in the middle of nowhere. Middle of nowhere. And that's in um, Wisconsin, right? Well, it's the upper peninsula of Michigan. Like okay. Kind of yeah. um, but there's okay. people that buy and rent a home. So, I mean, if, if you really want a house, you can find out. That's, this is true. Let's go for it. When you're doing rehab, do you take certain security uh, measures when you're doing like a full down rehab? Uh, for a full permit. Um, <laughs> it wouldn't be an experience. Yeah. Well, um, and this is going to. I'm the wrong guy to ask this because. My truck is outside, unlocked with keys in it. Uh, I don't lock anything. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't do things. If people want it, they're going to get it. So um, whether I I, I, I joke because Holly's mom lives has lived in the same house forever in Savannah Ridge on uh, on seventy fourth place, and we had three cars on the road. Um, Holly's car was locked. Her mom's car was locked. My truck was unlocked with a with a uh, with a brand new uh, like drill in a case. I had a nice radio and I had like 40 bucks on the dash. 
They broke her window, stole her radio. They broke her not window, stole the radio, and they walked right past my truck. So, <laughs> I don't know. I think I feel like if people want to steal it, they're going to steal it. So, <laughs> the biggest of all so, yeah. so let me ask you this. How many of your properties during the rehab have been, been broken into? Never. Okay. They all break in Wayne's property. So Wayne's gets all the property. That's so funny. You're so true. It's all right. It's all right. So, um, so we've I, I've done twelve hundred rehabs in in my career, and I think we have um, we we had a problem a couple of years back in Hammond on a, in a duplex. We just kept getting broken into. It was a neighbor every single freaking time, um, and then we just had a house. Honestly, like we literally this just just happened. This house hasn't even closed yet. It's, it's under contract right now to, with a buyer, but in in Etna, um, and they got broken into seven times. So like once it gets broken into once, I'd probably like then I would probably actually start putting the stuff on there. But honestly, we normally don't put any security on it. Um, we normally don't do any of that stuff. Jared, I mean, any other like other than like what, those two instances, like maybe a, maybe a little something here or there. But honestly, you might. You know, we it's not honestly. It's not like it was ten years ago. Ten years ago, like most. People that were doing rehabs in Gary, they were boarding up their windows before they started. They were putting these big, you know, steel book beams up everywhere. But honestly, like there's rehabs happening every, and this is even in Gary. So most of this stuff is in Belpo. Um, I'm like him, like people used to make fun of me because I just leave the front door of my house unlocked. Um, and they're like, why don't you leave the front door? I'm like, if somebody wants it, they're gonna they're gonna get it. I mean, like, who cares? It's like whatever, it's just stuck. You know, and unless they get your safe and you have cash or a gun or something in there, then that's about the most worst thing I would want somebody to get, you know. But. Do you find out, do you find in Gary when you're rehabbing that the neighbors are like so happy that you're doing something to improve it, they walk over the house? Cool. Yes and no. Yeah, a lot of times, yeah. Most of the time they want to like, are you renting this house? Yeah. Like, that's the question we get. Like, I want to rent this house or I want to buy this. Actually, I think we just saw on 52nd. Like, I'm pretty sure it was the neighbor's family that bought that house. We've had a configuration for it all. Yeah. Actually, tell our guy, you know, hey, there's some guys walking around. Yeah. Yeah. You I think I'm super contractor, but in both instances, the neighbors are like the nicest. One of them, he hired her. She's an old Vietnam vet. And she's like, I need a job. I don't feel you know, like, can I clean that up for you? Under the table? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've tried to hire some kids. If you get kids out that want to work, I've tried to like give them, you know, I'll give you 40 bucks if you get this, you know, yard cleaned up or something just to kind of, right. you know, have a safe face in yeah. the neighborhood. But any other questions on rental portfolios or anything else like that? Did, did that answer your question on the rehabs? And yeah, if you're really concerned, I mean, you can go get go pay for ADT or whatever. But like we did it on that house, but that was because we got broken into like two or three times, and um, I, I it literally got broken into seven times, and I think it was all a neighbor like every time. But like the, the property that we've ever gotten broken into, they didn't have security doors. So I think if you, if, like, if you're worried about it, put a security door, especially the next door, that way they can't break into the building. Yeah. That's the first time it's about maybe like three times over that five, six years. And then we just put a security door and then it's gone. Yeah, or you can always, if it's a door that opens in, yeah. you can always like put like a, 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 a wood, yeah. you know, like a two by four across the, they, they can't get in that unless. <laughs> Um, but like you said, if they really want to get in, they're going to break a window and get in at that point, you know, so anything else? Anything else you want to give, give Kevin? What kind of property do you live with? Is like your bread and butter? Like, do you prefer like brick uh, building? Do you prefer um, frame buildings? I prefer um, three bedroom houses on a slab so I your basement calls. Valvo, no fence. I take the fences down everywhere I go because they're going to hide all that stuff and leave it all back up for me when they move out. I try to take down the sheds so I don't have to clean up the sheds when I'm done. I take down the uh, storm doors because they, they break them when I buy them once. So none of my rentals have storm doors. Um, that's obviously the idea. Uh, but what do they say? What does my tenants say? Everybody's got a plan until you get the hit in the face and somebody gives you a deal on something you buy and it's got a bit of in a fence. So I have all kinds of stuff. Most of my stuff is in Valpo, downtown, old um, Michigan basements. Um, I like busy streets so I can drive past them. Um, but I 
I try to really hone in on what I have. I, most of it's Apple or Hobart. I have two in Portage, one in Cherigo, um, one in Knox, but most of it's Apple. And I really don't have a choice. If I want to be downtown, it's going to be old. You know, most of my stuff is 1890, 1910. My office on Lincoln is 1865. Hey, everybody, we're back. Did you guys, I hope you guys paid attention to what Kevin was talking about. Um, he gave, he really gave one key to business, like one thing. If you don't get anything else out of this entire podcast, I want you to get this one thing. And that is consistency wins the game. Mm. <laughs> you know, he talked about like, he doesn't care what business you're in. Mm. Um, if you will just be consistent with whatever you're doing marketing wise for six months, like you, it will actually work. You, you, you can't stop. You have to be relentless for a period of time. Then does that mean you have to be relentless for your whole life? No, but you've got to be like absolutely relentless. I love his masterful marketing plan. If you guys didn't hit that, please go back and listen to this marketing plan. It is, it, it will blow your mind how simple it is, but also um, how, how well he does. He also talks about his list. Like he understands his list. Um, and I love the fact that he even puts all of his customers into three different buckets, his A, his B and his C customers. And he's always trying to move his C customers to his B bucket and his B customers to his A bucket. Right. And then he talked about how often you had to get in touch with your A customers and your B customers and C customers. I thought it was really good. It was, it was a little, I don't know, convicting for me to a certain degree, some things that I need to get better. I hope it helped you guys. Um, and I'd love to hear from you guys. I'd love to hear, you know, what your thoughts are and maybe what you learned from it. So post those in the comment below if you're watching this on YouTube or if you're, you're seeing this on Facebook or one of our other social media platforms or just get, get in touch with us. You guys can email Jared um, and let us know what other kind of podcasts you might want to listen to um, and what other helps that we can give you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you can get on our buyers list. And uh, if you go to our website at buyonegroup.com, you can come check us out. You can see, first of all, other podcasts we've done. But uh, you can also join our buyers list. You can connect and be on a call with me. Uh, we, we build rental portfolios for investors. So we can help you get started or we can help you add to what you currently have. And so if you'd like to, to come visit our location, you could do that. And I take you around and show you the city of Gary and show you what kind of uh, properties we're doing, what kind of, kind of areas we work in. And so we can schedule an appointment for that. And, uh, and so, but you also have a couple other things you're, you're looking to propose or offer or uh, discuss. So, yeah, I am. So we are going to be starting soon. I don't have, I can't, I don't, I don't know when right now, but we're going to be starting soon. Um, offering the meetup group that we just had mm -hmm. virtually. So if you don't live in Northwest Indiana and you're like, Hey, I want to be a part of this meetup group. Um, you guys can, yeah. you, you'll be able to join. Um, again, like, I don't know if our marketing team will have this already, you know, quite yet, but we, but we, but I, I offer a yearly membership and a lifetime membership and the lifetime membership costs are going to go through the roof at the end of this year. So I've been offering this lifetime membership. That's really cheap. And we're gonna start, we're not gonna be doing that um, at that price anymore. Um, and then a couple things you won't get, obviously. So you know, one one of the things that the lifetime members for our meetup group get is they get two hours with me. They sit down. We can build a business plan if they want. We can just get connections if we want. But you won't get that. Um, but uh, but but we we're we're, we're 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 working on the details of that. Um, but it's basically gonna be our video library and access virtually, so you can actually kind of be there on Zoom. Um, for all of our, our meetup groups as well and our, our library of all of our, our videos and stuff in the past. So just remember, guys, we do build rental portfolios for investors. If you are interested in us building you a rental portfolio right here in Northwest Indiana or potentially in Pensacola, Florida, mm -hmm. um, you guys can get on our buyers list. Um, Jared at buyonegroup.com. Mm -hmm. And um, you can also go to our it. website at buyonegroup.com. All right. And that's going to be it yeah. for today, guys. Hope you guys have a good day. Thanks for joining us. God Back bless. to turnkey. The best way to do rentals. God bless. One Group Network makes no warranty, guarantee, or representation as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information featured in this podcast. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only, and any reliance on the information provided in this podcast is done at your own risk. This podcast should not be considered professional advice. Unless specifically stated otherwise, One Group Network does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast, and information from this podcast should not be referenced in any way to imply such approval or endorsement. Any third-party materials or content of any third-party site referenced in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions, standards, or policy of One Group Network. One Group Network assumes no responsibility or liability for the accuracy or completeness of the content contained in the third-party materials or on third-party sites referenced in this podcast or the compliance with applicable laws of such materials and or links referenced herein.